Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Chapter 4 of Book 5 of the Brothers Karamazov culminates in an argument, or you might say a stance, being taken by one of the brothers, Ivan, in his conversation. It's a fairly one-sided conversation with his brother, Alyosha. And Ivan is setting out a problematic that we can identify as what's called the problem of evil in philosophy of religion. Namely, if there is this great God, then why do we have so much suffering and evil and misery in the world? How can we reconcile the traditional attributes of God and all of this terrible stuff that we see. And Ivan is very uh, an interesting case here because he doesn't just talk about what happens to other people or what he sees other people doing. He even talks about his own bad deeds. And so he's conscious of this as not just a problem, but a problem that involves him as well. And he's going to set out a resolution, though not solution, to this, this issue, which Alyosha identifies as rebellion, although Ivan is going to say it's not actually just rebellion, and we want to look at the way in which he sets it up. But first, we want to look at what his, his main issue or complaint is. He says, we have this problem of human suffering, and he laid out the suffering of children uh, with quite a few cases, including a child who became an adult, had a really screwed up life, gets executed as a result of crimes that he commits. Human responsibility and freedom. Do these things actually make sense in any way? And, you know, if you think about suffering itself, when a person is suffering, there's a kind of revolt or rebellion against it. Sometimes there's acquiescence in it as well, or even a kind of collaboration with it. But that's, that's not an immediate response. And there is a tendency to, to say, well, what, what is this about? Why does this have to happen? Why are things the way they are? And so Ivan says, I took children to make it more obvious about all the other human tears that have soaked the whole world through from crust to core. I don't say a word. I've purposely narrowed down my theme. And he says, I don't understand why things are arranged as they are. And then he lays out what we could call three possibilities. So one of these, and you could, you could look at this in terms of, you know, his reference to the biblical Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and eating of the apple or rather fruit because it's not actually called an apple in the Genesis account. And the uh, learning or realization of a greater dimension to life, knowledge of good and evil. Before that, Adam and Eve were innocent. After eating the apple, not only are they screwed up because they disobeyed God, and we can actually put that to the side, they're also screwed up because they're now aware of things in a very different way. And we don't necessarily have to use this biblical account to talk about how human beings, by virtue of being the kind of creatures that we are, are screwed up in that way. Ivan puts it in terms of humans wanted freedom and they wanted knowledge of good and evil. So you could say, that's what comes with it. Too bad. You're kind of stuck. People are going to suffer, including the ones who are tormentors, but even more, the ones who are tormented. He says, um, they were given paradise. They wanted freedom. They stole fire from heaven, knowing they would become unhappy. Why pity them? This is, in fact, a stance that many people take. 
Ivan does not take that stance himself. He's just saying that's a possibility. There's another stance that's also possible, which he is tempted by, but doesn't find satisfactory. And you could associate this with a, a kind of, you know, view of life as just cause and effect that can be understood through the sciences or through positivism in philosophy, uh, you know, sort of a reductive view on, on human beings in reality. And he says, with my pathetic earthly Euclidean mind, he's using Euclid and geometry there as sort of an example. He could have said Newtonian, he could have said whatever. So he says, I know that there is suffering and that none are to blame, that all things follow simply and directly from another, from another, that everything flows and finds its level. So this is a sort of viewpoint on things that says, well, people do bad things to each other. They're not, not truly bad. They're just things. And they're, you know, motivated or necessitated by psychological laws and dynamics and the traumas that they've gone through. Nobody's really to blame. People just do what they do according to, you know, all, how all these natural laws and causes and effect fit together. Now, then he says, that's all just Euclidean gibberish. Of course I know that, and of course I cannot consent to live by it. This is very interesting. He's saying, you know, in a certain sense this is true, but I can't actually follow it and live with it. You may have all these laws of nature that have been discovered, that can't be the whole story. So here he talks about something else that is discussed under the aspect of retribution. When we hear this word retribution, we think of revenge. We think of uh, imposing some suffering on somebody who's made somebody else suffer, right? And what sometimes gets left out of this is that retribution can, in fact, be a rectification. It can involve justice. It can... Uh, you know, through punishment, sometimes make the bad person realize their badness and want to change, want to become better. So he talks here about retribution and he says, I need retribution. Otherwise, I will destroy myself. And retribution, not somewhere and sometime in infinity, but here and now on earth. I want to see that the, 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 bad things that have been done are somehow taken into account and the evildoers are punished and something is restored to those who had something taken away from them. I want to see this happening here on earth. I have this desire. He knows that that's not going to happen. He's given plenty of examples of cases where it simply can't happen. The child is dead. You're not going to get a child back. You can't have the child uneaten by the dogs or you can't have the, the young man uh, un, unhung or uh, unguillotined or anything like that. You can't have his parents um, feed him and clothe him when they, they ought to have. So these are three different possible responses. Another possible response that a lot of people make, and not just religious people, sometimes secular people as well, they'll say, well, this is all part of some you know, great plan. And this goes beyond the, you know, Euclidean point of view, which says, listen, there's suffering. It's just the way it is, you know, cause and effect, laws and all that. This says, this is actually arranged in some way that it brings about a better result. Could be, you know, a, a sort of secular uh, progressivism that says, well, all of this is actually for the good of humanity later on. All of his suffering will be redeemed and recovered somehow. Could be religious. He, he says that um, I want to see for myself, uh, so let them resurrect me. Is it possible that I've suffered so that I, together with my evil deeds and suffering, should be manure for someone's future harmony? I want to see with my own eyes the hind lie, lie down with the lion and the murdered man rise up and embrace his murderer. I want to be there when everyone suddenly finds out what it was all for. How all of this figured into some future higher harmony. A, a concordance is another word of talking about this. And here we actually ought to take a pause. It's interesting that he frames things in this way. I think a lot of people are used to 
consoling themselves with harm that's done and killing and all sorts of trauma and abuse by saying, well, you know, the person who suffered that will get to heaven or some other thing and it's going to be a-okay for them. And so that is a Christian motif, right? But traditional Christianity never stressed the individual having their own little afterlife all by themselves. The afterlife is supposed to be for, for paradise or for heaven. It's supposed to be a harmony, a concord. It's not just you getting to enjoy whatever you want because life sucked for you back then on earth. No, it's something different. You fit in with all these other people. Anselm, for example, talks about, as he's speculating about what the joy in heaven is going to be like, everybody having their own will, but it also harmonizing with everybody else's will in the divine will. So we don't lose any of our humanity, but we are part of a community. In fact, you might say the community, that all other communities are merely a dim reflection of. So that's one of the answers that's often given. And he says, this doesn't satisfy me. I, I can't go along with this. On the one hand, all religions on earth, he says, are based on desire for this. So there's something in the human being that really wants to have something that we don't have, this entire agreement, this entire valuing of everybody by everybody else. But children's suffering poses a set of real significant problems. He says, if children must suffer in order to buy eternal harmony with their suffering, tell me what children have got to do with it. It's incomprehensible why they should have to suffer and why they should buy harmony with their suffering. Why do they get thrown on the pile to manure someone's future harmony with themselves? So on the one hand, you can say, how does the suffering of children actually make anything better and generate this, this future condition in which we're all going to be like on the same page? And then how is it good for these children themselves? They, they didn't deserve to suffer. How is this going to match up with this, this harmony? And he says, if it's really true that they're in solidarity with their fathers and all the fathers evil doing, that truth is certainly not of this world and is incomprehensible to me. I can't buy that sort of explanation of, well, we all sinned in Adam. So what? Children aren't actually sinful at the point that we're talking about, according to, to Ivan. And according to traditional understandings of the age of reason and culpability or guilt. He goes on and he says, some joker will say perhaps in any case the child will grow up and have time enough to sin, but that's not the case of the children I'm talking about. The boy who was torn apart by dogs, he was too young to have had that happen. He did an innocent little act that hurt a dog's paw and he had himself torn apart by a wicked general who, who had him hunted by his dogs as a result. There's no way to make that map into or map onto this harmony. He goes on and he says, um, it may be that if I live until that moment or rise again in order to see it, I myself will perhaps cry out with all the rest, looking at uh, the mother embracing her child's tormentor. Just are thou, O Lord, but I don't want to cry out with them. Why not? The mother could forgive the general for killing her child in a horrible way for, for you know, trivial reasons for engaging in an evil act, but the mother can't forgive on behalf of the child. That would be wrong, according to Ivan. He says, um, even if you do avenge them, can they be redeemed by being avenged? What do I care if they're avenged? What do I care if the tormentors are in hell? What can hell set right here if these ones have already been tormented? Sending the evildoers down to the hell doesn't make things better for all the children who have been brutalized, who have been raped, who've been killed, who've been tormented in their lifetimes. And, you know, if there is hell, how does that fit into this, this future harmony as well? So Ivan's stance that he takes here, which is being labeled as rebellion, 
by Alyosha, an existential stance where he's taking responsibility for this own stance. He knows that it's in some respect irrational, but this is in fact what he says he has to do. He says, I'm going to remain with this suffering and indignation. He says, even if I'm wrong, I don't want harmony for love of mankind. I don't want it. I want to remain with unrequited suffering, even if I'm wrong. So he knows that there's the possibility of getting things wrong. And then he's got this interesting metaphor of returning the ticket. What does that mean? The ticket is this acceptance of all of these things that are happening in the name of some, you know, to come future higher harmony that we could perhaps have faith in. And he says, I can't buy that. And the right thing for me to do is not just to wait until the end and then say, ah, you know, I don't buy it now. It's to say, I don't buy this in advance. God, you keep your deal. I'm not going to go along with it. I can't change the nature of the deal, but I do at least control whether I assent or refuse. And I refuse. So Alyosha, after uh, Ivan says, I'm, I'm just most respectfully to return to God the ticket. I, I do accept God, but I'm not going to buy into this deal. And Alyosha says, that's rebellion. And Ivan says, I don't like hearing such a word from you. One cannot live by rebellion, and I want to live. So there's something more that Ivan is looking for other than just a refusal. And again, this is reflecting a deeply existential stance towards this problem of suffering, misery, evil here that we experience as applied in particular to those who you would think are the most innocent children. This is Ivan's rebellion, better understood as returning the ticket in advance.